I'm Connor Rebush, and if you are interested in the finer points of face punching, you've come to the right place. This is Heavy Hands. Hello and welcome to Heavy Hands. I am your host, Connor Rebush, joined, as always, by Dr. Patrick Wyman. It didn't used to be Dr. Patrick Wyman, but from uh, here on out, it will be. And uh, you may notice a difference in the quality of Dr. Pat's voice. Pat, you've got a fancy new podcasting microphone. I have a fancy new podcasting microphone. Yeah, I don't know. I, uh, I'm looking forward to hearing this played back and just, just, to, just to experience the crystal clarity for myself. Yeah, you, well, you want to appreciate the full register of that sonorous voice. You know, you want to be able to just kind of sink into those, um, those warm tones that you are known for, I think, in the podcasting community, I think. <laughs> On the forums, you know, the forums that all of us podcasters visit in our private time, people, they tend to talk about that, just that, uh, the clarion sounds of uh, Dr. Patrick Wyman's voice. Yeah, look, I got a, I got a face for radio and a voice for T and a voice for, uh, <laughs> for newspaper. I put it that way. I don't know about that. I don't know about that. Um, well, today, today, Pat, we have a lot of things to talk about, but uh, it has been some time, and somebody pointed this out in some of our comments uh, on Bloody Elbow. We're brought to you by Bloody Elbow, by the way. <laughs> That's the first time I've mentioned it, it, that. Honestly, it's been like seven weeks since we've mentioned that. I think it's been more. It's been some time. Uh, it's in the YouTube video descriptions on all of them, so at least we have that. But uh, somebody in our uh, Bloody Elbow comments section, and I will try to find their name so I can uh, thank them for the suggestion, they kind of mentioned that it's been some time since we have done a concept-driven episode. And I think, uh, obviously, we cover fights. The UFC schedule is insane. There's always stuff to be talking about. It's very rare that we even have a week between shows. And when that happens, it's usually like we're, re we're recapping last week's, and then the next week, we're previewing the week that follows and so even a week off a weekend off between events doesn't give us all that much time um if we feel tied to the schedule and so i wanted to do a little bit more of a concept driven episode and you and i pretty much independently of one another uh came up with the idea that we wanted to talk about distance management and boxing for mma it's something that gets talked about a lot although i think both you and i feel there's not a lot of clarity on what mma boxing if it does exist really means and uh i think both you and i also agree that boxing has probably been the one thing that has improved most dramatically across the board for mma fighters in recent years before we get into that we do want to spare a few brief words for um the fall of brutal bob ruthless robbie lawler the most uh unlikely championship run ended in uh in well it was surprising in a disappointing kind of way but uh it, as it turns out that that awful gut feeling i had when his fight with tyron woodley was first announced um was not was not inappropriate my, my nightmare came to fruition pat it, it happened and tyron woodley absolutely obliterated robbie lawler with uh, one punch and then several equally vicious follow-ups that had Robbie struggling to stand. I, it looked like he almost twisted his ankle pretty badly trying to get back to his feet. It's not what you want to see from one of, I think, uh, the, the most beloved figures in MMA. Um, but we can kind of talk very briefly about why it happened and what, yeah. if anything, we learned from that result. Well, I think it was the opposite of shocking. Like all everybody who broke that fight down recognized the basic dynamic of the fight was going to be Woodley is really dangerous for about the first seven minutes or so. Um, if if Lawler could make it through that stretch, then his craft and his understanding of distance and timing and all of that would be able to compensate for the physical disparity between him and Woodley. Um, basically, that experience would overcome physicality and athleticism, and that as as the fight went on, Lawler, who's a great fifth round fighter, would have been able to would have been able to 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 put work in. Um, but I think everybody thought like. Yeah, Woodley's got a great shot, even against an iron chinned dude, of putting him of putting him down. Like Woodley is so fast and so strong and hits so so hard. Like he might legitimately be the best athlete in the UFC. Like he's probably it, like the other fighters in that conversation are Yoel Romero and Jose Aldo, and that's about it. Like Woodley is one of those. Woodley, it's those three guys in in some particular order. 
Um, and so I don't think it wasn't surprising that this happened. It was uh, it was maybe shocking that it happened that quickly and that violently and with so little happening before it. Um, and in that sense, it's a little bit disappointing because it's not like we saw anything new from from Woodley, really. Like maybe his setup was a little sharper. We didn't really see anything new or worse from Lawler either, aside from his ongoing transformation into a into a pretty pure counter puncher, a really patient dude. But like we didn't learn a whole lot from this, so it's a little disappointing in that sense. And it really, but it if anything, it just solidified what we already knew. It didn't teach us anything different. Yeah, it's the thing. The thing with Tyron Woodley. Um, it, it's difficult to separate the two things that I think make Woodley so dangerous. Um, and, and some of the things that also, these things also limit him in some ways. He is uh, an incredible athlete and a very smart guy. Uh, both of those things make him dangerous and both of them kind of limit him. I think it's difficult for Woodley, uh, like it has been for a lot of Supreme athletes, to really develop um, – just sort of to, to, to bring together from his influences in the gym a really cohesive, reliable, fundamental style of fighting, one which has sort of fake volume. Uh, and that's often the thing that, that really helps fighters. We talked about this with Robbie Lawler when he had his resurgence, that he was, as he is now, a fighter who didn't throw very much with, it, with intent, um, with murderous intent at the very least, but one who made it look like he was more active than he was and made his opponent open themselves up more than they would have otherwise by constantly sending out feelers. And that's the kind of thing that an insanely gifted athlete like Tyron Woodley, who I think is, as far as explosiveness, strength, power, speed, is far and away beyond even a guy like Robbie Lawler, who is a fantastic uh, lifelong athlete as well. It's difficult for a guy like Woodley to pick that up. He's also very smart. Um, he has a really good eye for tactics. His entry that set up that right hand that knocked Robbie out was really well done. He fainted his hands out of position through a second fate to sort of draw his eyes and came around with the right hand. And Robbie really, he saw it coming far, far too late. Um, and that also allowed Woodley to close the distance as Lawler knew something was coming and was trying to retreat. But that, that same, that, that intelligence for tactics, just like it kind of has for Lawler, makes it harder i think for woodley to to let his hands go and to take risks because yeah, so the, well i mean he did a couple of things before the finish like he 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 fainted a little bit but what those feints allowed him to do was cut a small outside angle and get his lead foot outside of lawler's uh it allowed him to back lawler up just a little bit further than lawler realized he was going so lawler was fairly it was fairly close to the fence he didn't have a lot of room to retreat and also before that little pawing sequence of, of feints uh, Woodley had fainted a level change yeah. also. So he worked all three of those things together. He worked, or, or all four of those things together. He worked the step to the outside with the feints, with the with the presence of the fence, with the faked level change. And all of those things put together are, are what created the threat that allowed him to move Lawler's hands out of position and cover the distance to land the right hand. Like, it was, I mean, it was smart. It was a smart setup. And I think if you're, if you're Woodley, like, you can learn something from brutal Bob Lawler and that's the importance of rhythm. Yeah. Um, so I think maybe we saw some nascent steps towards that in this fight. And maybe we'd seen a little bit of that in his last couple of fights with the paw, with the pawing jab, but just that just being able to gauge the distance um, and show your opponent one speed before you throw the fastball, just that is enough for an athlete of Woodley's caliber to, to massively raise his chances of winning the fight yeah. while maintaining the same pace that he's comfortable with for at least for more than seven or eight minutes. Yeah. And you know that Tyron Woodley is a smart guy, even outside of the, the fighting game or, or in the, the, the meta game of MMA. I mean, why else would he have made the brilliant decision to ask for a fight with Nick Diaz or GSP at UFC 202, getting those championship P, uh, pay-per-view points on the Conor McGregor, Nate Diaz rematch card against a big draw, a fight that Nick said he might actually be interested in taking if the money were right. Um, opening up his own gym, and I have no doubt that though a lot of people have done that, that Woodley will probably find success in doing that. The guy, as we learned when he came on the show, he knows how to market himself. He knows what he's doing. He's one of the only guys I can think of who was promised a title shot, sat on the sidelines, and got it. So there's something about Tyron Woodley that allows him to sort of navigate the waters of this sport as a sport uh, and as a business better than others. And I, I think it 
it would be a shame to just look at Tyron Woodley and say that he's nothing but a supreme athlete, that he's nothing but this, like he, like he's some sort of unthinking machine that just goes in there and surprises people with his speed. But I think that was the real thing here is that uh, it, it kind of did cement my notion that Robbie Lawler is declining in a way. I think the departure of his old boxing coach, um, Matt Pena, is that the man who was his boxing coach? Yeah, I mean, this brings uh, this brings us back to something we've talked about a fair bit on this show, which is your your theory of the puncher's path. Um, sure. And, you know, Lawler has kind of gone up and down with this, where for a long time he was more or less just a puncher, and then he kind of developed into this really tight, technical, uh, diverse version of himself, yep. and now he's kind of devolved a little bit again. Yeah. And there there are a lot of reasons why you go back and forth through these phases over the course of a fighter's career. But I think we may be seeing from Lawler one of the things that we saw from Anderson Silva and we've seen from other guys. That's that you can only fight in bursts when you get older. It's hard to work yourself True. into shape to go five hard rounds like even I mean, think about how much time Robbie Lawler has spent in camps over the last uh, over the last three and a half years since yeah. he since he returned to the UFC he's he kept fought, up at a ridiculous pace for a champion uh, and yeah, for I mean, a, somebody in contention he has fought a lot he fought he fought Josh Koscheck then he fought Bobby Volker then he fought uh, Rory McDonald then he fought uh, uh, Johnny Hendricks then he fought uh, Jake Ellenberger then he fought Matt Brown then he fought Hendricks again then he fought Rory Mack again um, then he fought Carlos Condit and then he fought, uh, uh and, and now he just fought Tyron Woodley. So that's, that's what, that's 10 fights in three and a half years. Yeah. It feels like Robbie Lawler's return to the UFC has been like an era. It's not even been that long. Yeah. He returned to the UFC. Uh, his, his first fight back in the UFC against Koscheck was on, it was the card where Ronda Rousey debuted. Mm -hmm. So like, yeah, I mean, but that's just uh, the point point being, even if those fights hadn't been wars, doing 10 fight camps in three and a half years is a ton of wear and tear on your body. That's a lot of that's a lot of sparring rounds. That's a lot of rounds of wrestling. That's a lot of minor nagging injuries. Like I talked to Lawler about that when I uh, when I interviewed him last October, that he talked about a thumb injury that he had that he aggravated that pushed that fight with Condit back to January that he said was he had aggravated an old thumb injury from like 12 or 13 years before. Like when you get to that point in your career, it's injury after injury like that. It's like like a nagging knee thing. It's like, oh, your hamstring hurts or your Achilles gets ag it gets irritated. Like it's all of those things put together, make it harder and harder and harder to get into the kind of shape necessary to throw 300 punches in a 25 minute fight. Yeah. And then the, the, the puncher's path thing. Um, I think a lot of people looked at the article I did with uh, on, on McGregor and it felt like something that was really like, um, this is, this is actually the secret to fight analysis is that if you just look at things from a really <laughs> basic analytical standpoint, you go off of things that we've already learned and you use that as predictive, people will think that you are like making insanely accurate predictions on some kind of, out of some kind of nebulous mass of information that they could never understand. And I don't think that's really true. I think it's really just about watching enough fights and, and, and learning the right things from them. And so the reason that I did that puncher's path piece is because that's something we see from almost all fighters, especially ones who are very powerful, especially guys like Robbie Lawler, who can go into a fight and blow somebody out of the water in the fifth round and save what has otherwise been an underwhelming performance and get himself a victory guy who knows he can do that. It's very, very difficult to, it's difficult for him to resist or for people around him to pull him away from the notion that, that, he doesn't necessarily need all the skills that he has in his arsenal, that he doesn't necessarily need all the game planning. Uh, and that even if you're doing these things in camp, he's going to go in there and, and a guy like Lawler is just going to feel the fight. He's just going to do what feels right because he knows he can put you away. I talked about that in a piece I did not long ago on um, Thomas Almeida and Cody Garbrandt. I talked about the difficulty of uh, pruning a prospect in MMA because, or in combat sports in general. I think combat sports are more difficult the, the the mountain is more difficult to climb in face punching sports than it is in any other because not only do you not have a team to rely on when you're in there but it's so intensely emotional um and so it, it's such a personal thing that you do when you go in there to fight that you it has a massive each and every fight has a massive impact on your mental state and so you get 
three wins under your belt, you feel unbeatable, you lose, you go back to being your old self, but sometimes only one or two more good wins and you feel unbeatable again. It's very, there's a lot of immediacy for fighters. And so it's really difficult to have a guy like Robbie Lawler and to keep him from going down that path, which is why it's so difficult to be a dominant champion in this sport. And we're really feeling the effects of that dynamic in 2016, where we have seen almost all of the belts taken. We, we've, we have very few champions that were around last year that are still holding their belts. Well, and I'll and I'll I'll do you one better on that puncher's path thing too. When you're 35 as opposed to when you're 31, you're not going to be able to train as much. You're not going to be able to put in as many sessions. Think about how much time it takes working pads and working movement to get to the point where you feel comfortable throwing the kind of volume that Lawler did. I guarantee you, I, I would bet you any amount of money that Lawler spent more time in the gym prior to the Hendricks fight than he did in, than he did before this one. I'll bet you any amount of money. Why? Because because two and a half years have passed since then. He's put in thousands of hours in the gym since then. And I would I, I just guarantee you that he could not physically put in as much work for this one. Yeah. Like he wasn't I mean, in his Robbie Lawler way, like he hinted at that when I when I talked to him last year. He's like, yeah, you know, I got to be smarter about it. I can't can't be as crazy. Can't put in it. Can't put in as much work. And that sounded like something that he had learned in the recent past, not before that. Like, sure. I th like I think for, I think for the two, uh, I think for like the Hend the first Hendricks fight, the Brown, uh, the Ellenberger fight, the Brown fight, the set maybe even the second Hendricks fight, he was able to put in a lot of work. Like he put in a lot of time in the gym, and you saw a really dramatic skill growth th from him in the uh, um, in those fights. But then I think the skill growth kind of stopped, and I would say that a lot of that had to do with just not being able to work as hard. And those four fights happened in one year. It's yep. worth remembering. He fought Johnny Hendricks for the first time in March and fought him the second time in December with two fights between. So that's not a pace that you can sustain as an aging athlete. Um, it does feel like that means maybe the era of Robbie Lawler is over. Although, like I said, a loss like this, like finally seeing an L on your records, finally seeing that red space on your Wikipedia page can make a fighter go back to the smart decisions that brought him to his resurgence in the first place. It's just such a difficult thing to get a handle on. It's so difficult to guide a fighter mentally, knowing that each and every fight is going to have such a profound impact on the way they feel going into the next one. So it's kind of hard to say at welterweight in general right now too, because this it's a division that has a whole bunch of aging guys at the top guys like Lawler and Maya and, uh, uh, and Carlos Condit, like dudes who dudes who have a lot of miles on them. But it's hard to say whether the next generation of young welterweights is ready to take that step up. Like, mm -hmm. is Neil Magny ready to be a top five welterweight? Is Kelvin Gastelum ready to be a top five guy? Like, it's possible. Um, but, you know, even guys like Woodley and Thompson are into their 30s. Like, mm -hmm. I think, what, Woodley is 34, Thompson's 33. Like, these are not necessarily young dudes themselves. So... With a, I could see Lawler getting back there with a. I think I could see Lawler beating uh, beating a couple of guys and, and getting himself another title shot. Like, it all depends on whether the guys who are who are coming up behind them are like ready to make that leap or not. Mm -hmm. Well, we said we'd be brief, and we weren't really, but there was a lot of interesting things to to talk about. That for as much as we said there, we didn't learn a lot. Um, it's given us an opportunity to sort of. Um, I don't know, an, a, a, introspective is not the right word, an opportunity to reflect on the nature of an athlete's career in MMA. Uh, we are at about the 17-minute mark, 18-minute mark, so why don't we actually take a break, and then we can have a nice long middle segment in which we get into the nature of boxing for MMA and uh, relate that to some of the other fights that have happened recently, including uh, Carl Frampton versus Leo Santa Cruz, a fantastic uh, fight of the year candidate that occurred last weekend. Uh, and some of the fights that are coming up soon, like uh, the main event of the next UFC Fight Night card, which is uh, Yair Rodriguez versus Alex Caceres. So we will talk about those fights in the frame of boxing for MMA, distance management, all that other little nitty gritty stuff after this break. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to this week's Heavy Hands. If you like what you hear, please consider pledging to support the podcast on Patreon. Patreon is basically continuous crowdfunding. You sign up to contribute a certain amount per month to help us with production costs and the like, and in return you get rewards ranging from a mention on the Heavy Hands website to a question or topic of your choice being discussed on the show. 
We have a lot more in the works to reward you for your help, and we appreciate every contribution. No amount is too small. Just head over to patreon.com and find how you can help out the only show dedicated to the finer points of face punching. Now let's get back to it. And we are back. Now, Pat, the way I would like to jumpstart this discussion is to actually look at some key points that I drew up for a series that I'm working on, which is part of the reason I wanted to talk about boxing for MMA as a topic. Um, Like I said before at the top of the show, it's something that interests me a lot because I feel like there are a lot of misconceptions about what is good boxing technique in general as well as what is good boxing technique for MMA, what differs between the two. And there are some accurate perceptions about that too. So uh, let me read to you the four key differences that I feel exist between MMA boxing and boxing for the ring. I feel that uh, the four differences are the guard. I think it's longer and lower in MMA. Um, on average than in boxing. And of course, these are generalizations. You can't ever, people often say, oh, he has a boxing stance when that doesn't mean much. For example, if you look at Carl Frampton and Leo Santa Cruz, you can tell a lot about the way those guys fight just by their stances. And both of them have very different ways of standing and carrying themselves, uh, whether guard or feet, foot position, posture, all of that. So, but I think the guard is generally different in MMA. I think that combinations in MMA generally shorter and less elaborate, more punctuated by movement. I think that head movement is less pronounced in MMA, partially because people haven't learned to use it, but also partially because there are more risks to consider when moving one's head in the cage. Um, Oh, I had a nice nice pop of breath there. (laughs) And I think that uh, holding and hitting and uh, other useful boxing fouls are expanded upon in MMA in a way that they can't be in boxing. The way that boxers try to push the rules sometimes are are ways that MMA fighters typically learn to fight, holding on to their opponents, roughhousing them, tying them up, and looking for things from those tie-ups in different ways than boxers can. And so that's expanded upon. Do you have anything that you think needs to be added to those? Yeah, so let's take a step back here real quick. Um, I think this uh, this go this should go without saying, but but it, it can't be repeated enough. And that's that boxing is not punching. Like I think this is a really common misconception among uh, among people who who follow MMA, people who train MMA, people who kickbox for sure. But boxing is not punching. There is a lot that goes into boxing that has uh, that has very little to do with the actual throwing of hands. Yeah. Primarily, uh, I think more than anything else, to me, boxing is about boxing is about moving your feet, how you move your feet, um, and where you are in the space of the and where you are in the space of the ring. I would say that boxing is is footwork and position, whether that means location yeah. in the cage or body position. Those are the things that your orientation relative to your opponent and relative to the space in which you are fighting and the way that you navigate it and the way you move around your opponent. Those are the primary things of boxing. Obviously, in, in boxing, you're scoring with your hands, and punching is the weapon with which we associate boxing, but there are boxing fundamentals that have been explored in boxing better, I think, than in any other uh, martial art that really feel endemic to that, to that craft. This is exactly this is exactly what I'm trying to get at. Footwork in boxing is tighter and sharper and more precise than it is in any other combat sport. Much more precise. The one that comes closest, I would say, is probably Dutch style kickboxing. Um, but again, that like these have to do with having a critical mass of professional people who do this for a living all the time. Yeah. Like that to me, that to me is the big one. So the angles are sharp. The angles are sharper. The pivots are tighter. The footwork is tighter. The uh, the understanding of positioning in the ring and the in the ring is much is much tighter. The punching is secondary to all that, I think. And so, kind of the baseline thing, Connor, that you and I t- were talking about yesterday when we hit upon this as a topic, I would say is for all the talk about the expansion of karate in MMA um, or other traditional martial arts and, and whatnot. I think the real revolution in MMA striking has been more of an appreciation of the subtleties of boxing in the last few years. Yeah, and, and, I, and I think it's because when, when people say that, oh, karate and taekwondo are being brought in, what they really mean are the big flashy techniques from those disciplines. And there are fighters who explore the other elements of those disciplines. You know, Anderson Silva... Uh, I think practice Taekwondo largely for footwork more than for the dynamic kicking that that sport is best known for, Uh, for the in and out movement, the sort of floating footwork, the surfing that Taekwondo uh, practitioners are known for. But 
generally people tend to notice spinning kicks, spinning shit, high flying techniques, things like that, really dynamic eye catching things. And they say, that's karate. That's not anything else. When people see punching, they, they just think it's punching. They're like, that's already in MMA. Uh, and when they see little subtle things like footwork, well, they don't generally see them actually. And so it doesn't it doesn't call attention to itself. Good boxing is like a uh, good bass, right? In a lot of bands, you don't necessarily notice the bass or the rhythm section unless it sucks or it's not there. Uh, and so the fact that uh, good boxers, you don't often marvel at what they're doing. That's kind of part of it is that these things are just fundamental. These little small steps, these tight pivots, these little uh, opening and closing of range. Those are things that don't catch the eye for a reason. It's small, it's subtle, it's economical and efficient. It makes you a better fighter without um, without calling attention to itself. Yeah, I mean, I'll give you a perfect example of this. Yeah. Jose Aldo. Um, sure. Five, five years ago, Jose Aldo was an almost pure Dutch style kickboxer. Um, with a little bit of a with a little with a little funkiness to him, but he basically did punches to kicks, and he he had pretty decent footwork and pretty decent head movement. But that was kind of but that was kind of the basis of his game. You look at Jose Aldo now, and he is almost a pure boxer, and I mean that in the full sense of the in the full sense of that term. Um, he's got great head movement. He's got layered defense. He's got really tight, really efficient footwork. We talked a few weeks ago after UFC 200 about, uh, uh, about how good his footwork was, about how little he had to move despite being the guy playing Matador. Mm -hmm. Despite being the outside fighter in that matchup with Frankie Edgar, he moved less than the guy who was pressuring. Like, that is an incredible accomplishment. But that right there is basic, fundamental, good boxing footwork. Yeah, and, and, and how, how, uh, how, how good of a, a proof is it of the point that I just made that even in that fight, one, one of the biggest stories of that fight for most fans and most commentators and, and analysts is the absence of Jose Aldo's thudding leg kicks. I think that was the thing that most people keyed on to is not look at how great and subtle his boxing is, but why didn't he kick more? Because even as Jose Aldo has become undeniably one of the best boxers in this sport, he is still known as the Muay Thai guy because that's the stuff that people remember. They remember when you chop someone's legs out from under them, not when you slide six inches back, pull your face just two inches away from the end of a punch and respond with a jab. They don't notice that stuff. Yeah, well, and, and look at Stephen Thompson, too. I'll give uh, Stephen Thompson is another perfect example sure. of uh, of this particular trend. Like obviously Stephen Thompson's background is in karate, but it's also in point kickboxing, which has twin roots in a karate but also boxing yeah a lot of american like people people forget this but like a lot of american like that point like the american kickboxing style came just as much out of uh, it came just as much out of like new york boxing gyms as it yeah. did karate students that was what the taekwondo and karate guys in in the long pants kickboxing of the 80s and 90s the uh the international kickboxers or i suppose i guess you'd call it um american kickboxing there's a term for it that I'm not really recalling right now, but the people who practiced that that form, uh, who who played that sport, as it were, long pants, often foot coverings and gloves in a ring, they were taekwondo and karate guys who learned to box. They went to boxing gyms. Uh, Zab Judah, very well known boxer. His father was a kickboxer. Yoel Judah was a kickboxer who taught his son to box because he learned to box in order to be a kickboxer. Yeah, there's great video out there of, uh, of of Lou Neglia, who runs the who has run the Ring yeah. of Combat uh, regional promotion. Um, Lou Neglia back in the '80s fighting basically a boxer dude in it in one of those long pants kickboxing matches. Like that's uh, but so point being. Um, when you look at Stephen Thompson's game, it's really easy to get fixated on the spinning kicks and the side kicks and the and the kind of and the kind of karate stuff that he does. But there is just as much good meat and potatoes. Um, uh, boxing footwork to what he does as there is karate yeah. footwork to what he does. Like there's those subtle backstepping, uh, those subtle back backstepping punches and the angles that he takes. That is just as much boxing as it is karate, if not more. Yeah. If anybody wants to see some really good boxing in a kickboxing, you should absolutely check out Peter Cunningham. I don't know if you've ever watched any of his fights, Pat, but Pete Sugarfoot Cunningham was like a boxing slickster in a long pants kickboxing format. And he fought a lot of Thai guys and like did a lot of convincing them not to chop his legs out from under him by bullshitting them and using his boxing to scare them off. Um, 
So it's yeah, it's absolutely a, it's absolutely a, a key element to that, and that is one of the reasons that Stephen Thompson has been so effective. Is not because he throws a thousand spinning kicks a minute, uh, because even Stephen Thompson, he knows he can't do that. You know, he knows that those are not fundamentals. Those are things that Stephen Thompson, he has honed those skills, but they are surprise tools for him. If he sees an opening, he will catch you off guard with something very tricky. But he knows he can't go in there and throw 10 wheel kicks around and expect each subsequent one to have the same effect. He goes in there, he moves, he draws you in, he pushes you back, he controls the distance and boxes until he sees an opening for some karate. Yeah, and these are uh, like these are the twin themes that we wanted to talk about today. Box, boxing and MMA and distance management are intertwined for exactly that reason. Because boxing has a lot of tools for helping you manage the distance, and your feet are first and foremost among them, right? Like your footwork, your angles, your control of space, your sidesteps, your pivots. Like those are those are tools to allow you to control the distance and to control the range at which the fight at which the fight takes place, um, as much as anything else. And so. It, you know, it's interesting that we're talking about Stephen Thompson because he contrasts pretty strongly with somebody who's fighting, uh, who's fighting this upcoming weekend in that regard, in Yair Rodriguez. It would be really easy to look at Thompson and Rodriguez as uh, as as kind of representatives of the same phenomenon of this uh, this move towards rangy kicking and unorthodox striking, but they're not the same. Because they're not the same to the extent that. Thompson has those other tools. He has that kind of subtle footwork and awareness of where he is in the in the space of the cage. He, but most importantly, Thompson has a punching game, and in a, a sense, yeah, and, and, and that a, allows him to manage distance. Yeah, yeah, he has a, a a a nuanced understanding of how to use his hands and the threat of his hands. Um, to to keep his opponent at bay one of the biggest things i talk I, I actually haven't talked about position all that much lately but it was kind of the first big conceptual thing that opened my eyes to the the technique that goes into the the the, the, the technique that goes into tactical fighting um positioning yourself so that you are always as safe as possible and so that you are always as threatening as possible at all times. And this is this is the kind of stuff that can make what a lot of people call boring fights really fascinating. Um, when you see high-level boxers or high-level mixed martial artists jockeying for position, when you see them making little adjustments and just stepping around each other, and neither guy can really get the other guy to open himself up, and neither guy is willing to commit because the other guy is also constantly adjusting, that is because they're both very conscious of their position. It's something you don't see as much in MMA. You see a lot more people standing still and looking at their opponents in MMA, which is not something you see in boxing unless someone's trying to lay a trap. Um, you see a lot of counterpunching by default in MMA because fighters are not comfortable leading because they don't necessarily always know how to position themselves the way that boxers do. Now, we're seeing an improvement in this, but uh, let, let's talk about Yair Rodriguez a little bit because... I want to talk about how a guy like Rodriguez has gotten around this problem because you and I agree Rodriguez does not have a boxing game. Uh, no, he has some of the things that we talked about being part of boxing, like footwork and all of that, but he, he doesn't have a punching game. And see, he, I, I disagree a little bit. I think that he can throw punches. I don't think that he has yeah. the, I don't think that he has a boxing game in the sense of that kind of tight footwork or yes. necessarily the awareness of where he is in the cage. Like you look at Rodriguez and he knows how to throw one punch after another and he knows how to he knows sometimes how to follow those with kicks like it almost looked like his punching regressed a little bit from the uh dan hooker fight to the feely fight but what he doesn't have is the ability to take a tight pivot like no he's I, got he's got anthony pettis type of footwork yeah he, he he understands lateral movement he understands that he's supposed to be moving he understands that he's not supposed to let himself get trapped in place between the fence and his opponent on a basic level, he has a grasp of that. But much like Anthony Pettis, uh, and we saw that so strongly when he fought Edson Barboza, when put in that kind of position, it, it's pretty evident that he doesn't know how to actually fight out of that position. Boxing for MMA is, especially for guys like Rodriguez, you may not want to be in boxing range very often. And that's fine. You have that option in MMA. And that is why boxing for MMA is quite different than boxing for the prize fighting ring. Because you're not obliged to box with or to punch with your opponent. But boxing in MMA is kind of like scrambling ability. Uh, it, it's kind of like a sweep game. 
uh, for fighters like Yair, Yair Rodriguez. It is the phase, the skill set that allows you to navigate what are for you and your style a tough spot. Um, for Rodriguez to be trapped near the fence and have only two feet of space between himself and his opponent, to not have the understanding of how to point your lead foot at your opponent, how to line up your jab with your opponent, how to feint and punch your way away from the cage, how to do the kind of things that, that Mark Henry has guys like Frankie Edgar and Edson Barboza do, or the kinds of things that Jose Aldo do, uh, does, that's, that's a big hole in his game. And you, you, I think have come around to this notion kind of recently that that is actually a pretty, a pretty, um, a fairly ragged hole right in the middle of Yair Rodriguez's MMA skill set. Yeah, because I think that I saw uh, some. I think that I saw the improvements that he made from his first couple of fights to the to the Hooker fight, and I thought that there was a clear kind of. Uh, um, I thought that there was like a clear progression there that yeah. like that stuff wasn't far behind. But then watching the Feely fight, it couldn't have been more clear that like that was kind of a false positive. You know, sure. that, that doesn't mean that he can't add those things. But or they or that he is forever doomed to do uh, to be that guy. But like, I haven't seen it yet. You yeah. know, so so and let's so, let's go ahead and run down why it's so important then. Um, I just kind of hinted at it. But well, so you can't it's because at some point you're going to be put in a position that you don't want to be in. Like Yair Rodriguez's game relies on setting his opponent either all the way out or all the way in. That's the classic outside fighter fighter kind of game that we've talked about. And because he uses that arsenal of of long rangey kicks, the side kicks to the thigh, oblique kicks to the thigh, side kicks to the body, front kicks to the body, uh, spinning back kicks, round kicks, uh, jumping kicks, all of that stuff, he can he, his outside is further is further away than most fighters outside is. He creates a really really long distance for his opponents to cover. But then to back that up, he has a really good clinch game. He's got really slick clinch takedowns. He throws nasty knees inside. He throws some elbows, some short punches. So he can either go all the way out or all the way in. He has two options. It's not like once you get through his long kicks, he is completely helpless. But there is a space between that clinch game um, and the uh, bet between the tie ups and between all the way outside where he does not have a whole lot to offer. And that's the that's kind of the basic issue. Yeah. So on, on the punching side. Punching is a part of boxing. I think it would be silly to say that it doesn't matter or that when you punch well that you are not a good boxer uh, or that you're not using boxing. On the punching side, we, we talked about this a bit um, not long ago as it related to Aljamain Sterling. But for a game like Yair, a game like Yair Rodriguez's, it's very difficult to maintain the kind of activity you would need to keep a very skilled opponent at bay with just a kicking game. When you're moving that much and you are constantly using kicks, the, the, the simple truth is that punches are at least twice as efficient as kicks. You can throw a lot more punches than you can kicks in a fight. It's not because, not just because they're more difficult to set up and throw safely, but because they're harder to throw in volume, that you will look at any fighter, even the most prolific kickers, guys like Edson Barboza, guys like uh, Anthony Pettis, guys like Donald Cerrone, and they throw twice as many punches as they do kicks, if not more, in every single round of every single fight. Because it's it's nearly impossible to keep up that kind of volume. And so for Rodriguez, it's kind of a thin veneer that he has yet to face an opponent good enough to pierce. To, to actually... I, I think I'm going to compare it to this. This this is this is not a perfect comparison, but um, there's another fight that we talked about not, uh, not long ago, which was uh, Nicholas Dalby versus Zach Cummings. And Dolby's a better boxer than Yair Rodriguez. Uh, I think we both agree on that, right? Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, so Dol Dolby's a better boxer. But Dolby's game is still kind of like Rodriguez's. Um, it's an outside game with a lot of kicks, or it's a shot double and control on the ground. Those are the things that he really likes to do. He doesn't like to sit around in the pocket and, and use small movements to navigate mid-range. He doesn't like that. And... In Zach Cummings, Dalby found the first person who was confident enough, defensively skilled enough to to either kick with him at range and to compete with him at, at his preferred range or to defend and pierce that range on a consistent basis, to constantly step through that bubble and attack. And also the first opponent who was able to stop him from using that double leg switch up 
which has always been so reliable for him. And it was pretty disastrous. He didn't really come close at any point to winning that fight. He had a really rough time with Cummings. And in the same way for Rodriguez, but even worse, because he doesn't even throw combinations with his hands the way Cummings, uh, the way Dalby does, for Rodriguez, as soon as I think he fights a skilled opponent who can either kick with him at range or navigate through that distance consistently to attack him and an opponent who is not easy to take down, he's going to have a really, really hard time because that puts him in the range, that puts him in that scrambling range, which is mid-boxing distance, for which he has no answer. Yeah, so, like, let's, real quick, let's be clear about this. I don't think that Alex Caceres is the guy who's going to exploit that particular flaw in his game. Like, I think think he may give him some trouble because of his proficiency with kicks and his length, but he doesn't have that kind of pocket boxing, and he's very, very defensively vulnerable. Yeah, so so I think that, like, I agree. I think Caceres can give him some trouble and will probably win a round, maybe two rounds in this fight, in the spaces where he can actually keep the fight at that distance. But he's just too, he's just a little bit too short and doesn't throw, and his kicks aren't quite as long as Rodriguez is. But then, and, and conversely, he's nowhere close to the clinch fighter that Rodriguez is. Yeah. So Rodriguez will be able to bait Caceres into fighting in the clinch for long enough for, for Rodriguez to hit takedowns or knee him a little bit, or then get back to range. Yeah. Um, like, so Caceres can challenge him a little bit, but he isn't the kind, he doesn't have such a defined and clear advantage in that space that I would, that I would say, Oh yeah, no, I see Caceres path to victory very clearly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree with you there. But so, okay. So, so we talked a little bit here about if you want to be the kind of outside fighter who's either all the way out or all the way in. Let's talk a little bit about Rose Namajunas versus Karolina Kovalkiewicz because we saw in that fight uh, a slightly different problem with wanting to play an outside kind of game where you have the advantage at, at, at long punching distance. You may even have the advantage in the pocket, but if you have a but if you don't have the advantage in the clinch. Those those edges can be those edges can be in those other ranges can be taken away very quickly. Yeah. And and that's another thing that that's one of the key differences I mentioned before between boxing, boxing and MMA boxing in boxing, boxing. You need uh, outfighters are able to step in and cut off the distance to save themselves. That's something they can do. Um, It is very, very difficult. We have met we have discussed this many times in the past, but it's very, very difficult to always be outside, which is why you and I always say all the way out or all the way in. It's usually all the way out and all the way in over the course of a fight. They will make that exchange several times. But for MMA to play that game, it requires you to be able to outgrapple your opponent or at least to catch them off guard the way that Gustafson does with his sort of high doubles to, to get grapplers off him the way Holly Holm did when she got stung and rushed into a clinch takedown against Ronda Rousey. It requires you to be able to compete on a grappling basis with your opponent. And I think it seemed like Nama Yunus had a lot of difficulty once she realized that she couldn't get Kovalkiewicz down or that she couldn't outstrike her in the clinch. Once she made that realization, she felt like she had to be far away all the time and then sort of counterintuitively, it seemed like it led her to countering with a lot of heavier shots and planting her feet and exchanging more, trying to scare Kovalkiewicz off. And Kovalkiewicz is the kind of fighter who, once she knows that she has an avenue to success, she's going to keep pressing that advantage. Once she hits you with one thing, we've seen this in a lot of fights of hers. Um, Once she realized that she could leg kick Ronda Marcos with impunity, she leg kicked the hell out of her. And once she realized with Nama Yunus that she could get her under the clinch and beat her up with knees and elbows, she went after it relentlessly. She got stung on the way in, but she is a kind of fighter who's able to accept that it doesn't matter. She's a strategic fighter, right? She's a, she's a round winner, a fight winner. She's, she has a mindset where, she doesn't care if she loses an exchange if it means she gets to force one that favors her. Yeah, so I, I interpret I, I'm with you for most of that, especially the especially the your your interpretation of uh, of Kovalkiewicz. I part ways with you a little bit on why Nami Yunus ended up spending so much time in the clinch. Uh-huh. I just don't think that she was able to get it out of her head that she was supposed to be that she was supposed to be the better clinch fighter. Sure. Like, and so I think that. When she got into the clinch, it, initially she had some success. She landed that she landed better knees um, in the in the first clinch exchange. She couldn't take Kovalkiewicz down, but she had enough success to think, okay, I'm the better clinch fighter here. I have this as a safety blanket when I get when I get too far inside. 
right? That if, uh, that if for whatever reason I can't be at that long punching distance, I don't want to be in the pocket, I'm going to be safe to go into the clinch. Then she lost the next clinch exchange, and she ate a whole series of beautiful knees to the body. Like, a, like uh, Kovalkiewicz grabbed a great double collar tie and landed like four consecutive knees to the body. Yeah. All of them were really hard. And then a slashing elbow right across Lama Yunus's forehead. You like, don't often see it. She went full-on skip knees like she was hitting a heavy bag. She, yeah, she just was, wrenched down her neck and just hopped into four or five knees one after the other it was absolutely gorgeous and so then nam yunus lost that exchange but i think nam yunus still had the first one in her head and she thought okay that was one exchange i'm still the better clinch fighter the next time she got in there she spent a solid 30 45 seconds in the clinch with kovalkiewicz and lost that exchange way worse than she did even the second one um and but those two clinch exchanges i think were all it took to lose Nami Yunus the fight. It was that second bad decision to say, okay, I'm going to go in there again. And the third bad decision to say, okay, I'm going to go into the clinch again. When she had so clearly lost, she so clearly lost like three clinch exchanges in a row. Yeah. A, it drained her gas tank. I think that was the big one. Like you can't eat 12 or 15 knees to the body from a, uh, from a clinch fighter who knows what they're doing the way that Kovalkiewicz does Mm -hmm. without, uh, without that putting a serious dent in whatever the rest of your plan is. It takes, uh, it takes energy to stick and move on the outside, even when you do it as efficiently as somebody like Rose Namajunas can when she looks good. Um, it takes energy to do that. You have to have re- you have to have reserves, or you have to have a backup plan. And and Kovalkiewicz took her backup plan away. Do you think that there's something to the notion that Namajunas's mental state played a part in that sort of approach to the fight? Do, I, I think watching it, I kind of get the sense that she still feels like a grappler who is learning to box rather than someone who can just outbox her opponent. Because it did feel like, even even as difficult as it is, had she not tried to hurt Kovalkiewicz coming in, and had she not clinched with her the moment it became unfavorable, that she could have probably run Kovalkiewicz into jabs for the rest of the fight. Because she had a great first round when she did that, running her into these straight punches, moving, taking angles off of each one, and never mixing it up for more than two or three punches in mid-range. And but she didn't do that. Like she kind of felt like the fight was getting scrappy. And so she had to go for the takedown, something that's always worked for her in the past. I think one of the things that we're seeing in women's MMA right now is the difference between people who have a lot of fight experience and people who don't actually have that much fight experience. And I mean, fights as I mean, fights as fights. I don't mean sparring rounds. I don't mean grappling competitions. I mean, fights and this is something that you get when you have a long background in, in amateur Muay Thai and professional Muay Thai the way that uh, Kovalkiewicz and Joanna Janjacek do, like you, or even Holly Holm too. Uh, like you get this kind, of, you get this sense for what you need to do to win rounds and to win fights. And I think that like that's not something that can be replicated. We see it, like. I don't know if I is that making is that making any sense at all? Like when you take somebody like Ioana Janjacek who has dozens and dozens and dozens of fights, like they have a sense for for in fight decision making in a way that somebody like Rose Nama Yunus well, who N- has Nama Yunus basically Nama Yunus needs to have a fight like this before she can learn how to win a fight like this. Exactly, and I think that there's a difference between having a grappling match where you end up in 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 a weird spot versus having a match where somebody is trying to punch and kick and elbow you and knee you in the face. Yeah. You know. And I think that one of those is better at teaching those kinds of skills and that kind of that kind of sense for how to control yourself than the other. And so I don't think it's a coincidence that the two best fight IQs at 115 pounds are, Koval, are, are Kovalkiewicz and Janjacek, who have this incredibly deep background in these things. Yeah, I, I do think, however, that they're just tying it back to our discussion about boxing for MMA and distance management. I do think there's something to the notion that Nama Yunus took the wrong approach to boxing because I I do think going into the third round of this fight, she was no longer actively looking to clinch with Kovalkiewicz. She tried it. I think near the end of the first round, perhaps is when she had a good clinch exchange. Um, Yeah. Yeah. It was with like a minute left in the first round. And then she had a little bit of success in the second round. And then it started to pretty clearly go against her. And in the second round, she was going through this process where she was, she was pretty clearly thinking, okay, I'm, I'm supposed to go to the clinch because I'm a grappler or I'm supposed to be the better clinch fighter or whatever. And so she looked for it and then kept losing a few, a few clinch sequences in a row that did not go her way. She pretty clearly lost the second round because of that. I thought in the third round, um, Trevor Whitman told her to stay away from the clinch. She avoided that range as best she could, but Trevor Whitman also told her to take angles 
and to hit hard punches off of those angles. And I think that Mama Yunus seemed to feel like she had to hurt Kovalkiewicz or to nail her with something hard, and which led to her throwing longer and more engaging combinations. And Kovalkiewicz, by the third round, at least as far as I remember, was the one making the clinches happen. Nama Yunus was in a range where they could be allowed, but Kovalkiewicz was the one seeking the clinch. And Kovalkiewicz was being given a range that allowed her to close to clinch distance. Had, had Nama Yunus used nothing but her jab and front kicks and pot-shotted Kovalkiewicz and taken advantage of the fact that she has a longer frame, better boxing, and better, better boxing footwork, that she could have won that third round. But she was trying to nail Kovalkiewicz. She was trying to hit her. And I, and I think that's one of the biggest differences between MMA boxing and boxing boxing is that in the cage, you can't the, – the type of combinations that MMA fighters throw are very different from the type that boxers throw. We're going to be talking about Carl Frampton versus Leo Santa Cruz in a minute. But you don't see in MMA the kind of six- and seven-punch combinations those guys were throwing. And you don't see people keeping their arms tight to their body and using head position and hand fighting to light each other up with punches. Because when fighters get that close, usually, usually someone recognizes in MMA that they have an advantage when they grab onto the person. Whether they're trying to take them down or wrench them into shots uh, or control their body in some way, they're not going to assent to that. Um, whereas in boxing... Not only does it make more sense to keep your hands free and punch, but pe holding is actively penalized. And there really is no holding in MMA. It's not something that fighters have to worry about being shouted at for doing. You can grab onto someone as much as you want. And so you can't, as an MMA fighter, um, until you get really, really good, or unless you have an opponent who's really willing to give you the kind of fight you want, you can't afford to stay in relatively the same distance and let your hands go as much. You have to intersperse your attacks with more and more movement. You have to constantly be building bridges from one attack to a defense, to a move, to another attack, to a defense. Um, I bring this up all the time, but think of the way that Nate Diaz boxed with Conor McGregor. That Nate Diaz did not string together more than three punches at any time until he was trying to finish McGregor when he had him hurt in the second round. That he was constantly moving, changing angles, and keeping it so that he could stay on the either outside or inside of McGregor's effective range as often as possible. And that required him to constantly be changing the position of his body. That's something that boxers do too, but it's something that MMA fighters, I think there's more pressure on them to do it more often and in a different way than boxers. So I, I agree with the general principle, but I kind of disagree with the, with that being an explanation for for why Nami Yunus ran into trouble in the third round. OK, um, I, I agree with the idea that, that the combination structure has to be different in MMA. I think there's a lot more room in MMA for for like spamming one twos and one two threes and two threes and things like that than there necessarily is in boxing um, because you can because you can reset after every one of those two punch iterations. Right. Like you can reset the distance, you can toss in a kick in the middle and then you can go straight back to, to ramrodding the a yeah. one, two. And even more than that, that you have to reset or that you at least have yeah. to change the position between each of those attacks to avoid being um, unless you are also the superior grappler uh, to avoid being tied up or to avoid falling into a range that doesn't favor your skill set. Exactly. So I, I agree with that. Where I disagree a little bit is about Nami Yunus. I think the whole I think if she had had anything like the gas tank that she thought she would going into the third round, she would have been fine. But I think because she ate sure. so many knees to the body and because she got so clearly manhandled in like the second, third and fourth clinch exchanges that she had with Kovalkiewicz, I think that drained her a lot too. Like sure. she looked like a, she looked like she had spent the entirety of her gas tank in the first 10 minutes. Yeah. Like, or, or more specifically, basically that Kovalkiewicz reached into like took a, took a piece of plastic tubing shoved it into the gas tank and then just just sucked all the gas out with those knees to but the But how body. much more sense would it have made for her then just to jab? Um, it would have made it would have made more sense, but I think that if you're Trevor if, if you're Trevor Whitman, you're thinking you need to do something to disincentivize Kovalkiewicz from from getting inside. Yeah, but I think that's the difficulty with a fighter like Kovalkiewicz. Like I, I, I made this comparison before and I made it on Twitter, uh, and I'm sure people were were crossing their eyes and shaking their heads, but Kovalkiewicz has something that fighters like John Lineker and Marcos Maidana have, that she has a certain kind of doggedness where there are two ways that you can dissuade an aggressive fighter. You can scare them or you can frustrate them. 
And Kovalkiewicz is one of the fighters that I don't think you can scare. Like Lineker and like Maidana, when they know that they can hit you when you hit them, they are not going to be frightened of the fact that they're about to get hit. Those are the kind of fighters who accept the consequences and look to press the action at all costs, knowing that the more they hit you, they, they seem to know that there's a difference between personalities in there. That the other person, that, that the people they fight, don't react to getting hit the same way that they do. They know that there is an advantage to them in that kind of exchange. And so instead, you have to frustrate those fighters. You have to just deny them the chances to get to those range. You have to not use the jabs to hurt them, but use the jabs and the feints to blind them for a second and then move away and make them chase after you and make them come and make them hunt you down and, and make it so that they you basically have to create exchanges where they can't hit you when you hit them. By yeah, not that's committing. The, we'll, we'll talk a lot more about this yeah. in a couple of weeks with Conor McGregor versus Nate Diaz, sure. too. Um, but basically, with a fighter, a fighter like Kovalkiewicz, who depends very heavily on pace, right? Yeah. Like, you have to, like, you cannot allow yourself as their opponent to get sucked into fighting at their pace. Right. Nate Diaz does exactly this. Nick Diaz does exactly this. Uh, John Lineker does this, too. Tony like, Ferguson. We'll, yeah, Tony Ferguson is another guy who does exactly this. They're really, really durable, and they're really smart, and you have to understand what they're doing in kind of a game theory way, right? Like, yeah. th like these are fighters where the, you, the basic credo that you don't want to get hit does not necessarily it does not necessarily apply to them. They as you they're okay with you hitting them in kind of the broad context of the fight. Do they want to get hit? No, they don't want to get hit, but they accept that getting hit is a thing that's going to happen. And if they're in, they're in a situation where they're getting hit, that means that they can hit you twice. So it becomes in the con in that specific context a completely rational strategy for them. Yeah. Right? Like it's it, like by by sitting down on those three punch combinations and agreeing to exchange in the third round that was Nami Yuna saying okay I'm agreeing to fight on Kovalkiewicz's terms yes basically they're okay with getting hit if it means hitting you and so you have to fight a fight where them getting hit does not mean them hitting you you have to go with only your safest tactics you have that ratio we talked about about throwing simple short combinations and then resetting you have to dial that back so that instead of throwing two or three punch combinations, you're throwing jabs and double jabs and then resetting between each one. And very occasionally are you sitting down on a hard telling shot. And the goal there is to win a round, you know, is to say something to the judges more than it is to hurt the other person. And then you, you will hurt them. Except that you're not going to hurt that guy. Yeah, right. I mean, right? Te like... Tevin Farmer, one of my favorite boxers, he did this when he fought Ivan Redcatch this weekend on the undercard of the Santa Cruz Frampton fight. He went in there against Redcatch. Um, Farmer is a, a former featherweight. He went in at 130, and Redcatch is a is a big, a big junior lightweight and uh, a hard hitter. And he he more or less looked to neutralize him. He he didn't he went in there and very clearly knew that he wasn't going to hurt Redcatch until the end of the fight when he tried to knock him out when Redcatch was tired and had absorbed a lot of damage. But he spent the first six seven rounds of a ten round fight uh, picking his shots, trying to stay away, and just scoring. And I think it's very difficult for a lot of MMA fighters who don't have that depth of experience that boxers have or, or don't have boxing trainers like that in their gym or just haven't had tough fights where they've had to learn these lessons through experience to think about scoring rather than doing something decisive. It, it takes a tremendous amount of discipline to do that. Yeah. And who we were just talking about this with somebody, right? Like I, a few weeks ago, we were talking about some young fighter and how hard it is to have the discipline to do that over and over and over again, to just stick a couple of shots, move, score, and then and then get back to it. God, who maybe was we'll, this? Why don't we take a quick break so we can come back and talk about Frampton, Leo Santa Cruz, and maybe we will have thought of it by the time we come back. Financial support is fantastic, but there are other, even easier ways to support heavy hands. Perhaps the best is by spreading the word. We know our fan base. You're all cool, popular people with serious social media presences. You're tastemakers and trendsetters. Okay, there are one or two of you that don't fit that description. You know who you are. But no matter what, you can always help us out by telling folks about the show. And you can also give us a positive rating and review on iTunes and Stitcher, things like that. We rely on word of mouth and positive feedback to grow and improve. So thank you very much for your time and your help. Now, back to the show. 
And we are back. We remembered who it was that we were talking about. But before we do that, Pat, I want to thank some people who supported us on Patreon for the month of July. I think I only read half of the names I was supposed to over the course of July for the people who supported us in June. So please, patrons, accept my sincerest apologies. Um, I'm going to make a concerted effort to be better about thanking you guys on the show. It is the reward, reward that you were promised. I know it's not much of a reward, but I do want you guys to know how much we appreciate it. So I will thank some of the probably the top of the list to the same people who got thanked last month. Um, but these are our highest donating patrons, so I suppose they deserve it. Thank you very much to uh, Angel Jambazov, Christopher Waters, cool straight guy, <laughs> Mark Guagenti, Will Chernland, Ricky, Matt Giordano, and Eric. Thank you very much, guys. All of those are like $20 or up patrons for the most part, and um, that means a lot to us. It's, uh, you know, we still don't have advertisers for the show or anything. It's really nice to be um, compensated in some way for, for all of the work that we put in. And as much as we enjoy it just for its own merits, it's uh, it's always nice to get paid for doing something that you love. That's what it is. So you're, you're helping us keep the lights on. And uh, I'd say help, helping us keep the show free, but I don't think I would ever feel okay charging for a podcast. I don't think that works out well unless you're like Adam Carolla or someone. Yeah, seriously. Yeah, not even Joe Rogan charges for his. So. Well, and I, th- I really don't like it when uh, – when there's always a pitch there like oh you know if you don't donate the show's gonna go away like that's like that seems kind of crazy to me yeah there's no threat it's not like um if you sin you will go to hell it's not it's not it's more like um you will be a good person if you join our religion <laughs> it's it's uh it's not the threat but the but just the the sense of of helping us out we just appreciate the support rather than threatening you that you're not gonna be able to enjoy the show we like doing it too much to take it away and we love the interactions that we get we have a lot of heavy bag questions too that we can do next week but we have a lot of stuff yet to talk about um pat the fighter we were talking about was landon lando venata yes so we talked a lot about uh how like and this was something he mentioned to me when I when I interviewed him and I talked about it with Greg Jackson and Brandon Gibson, too, uh, in an article that I did for Bleacher Report, that like learning how to be disciplined and learning how to to overcome your instincts to to pour it on and try to finish how to uh, how to try to finish by upping your rhythm. This was the term that Greg Jackson used rather than letting your emotions get involved and throwing your throwing yourself emotionally into it. That these are skills that take years and years and years to develop. And um, Gibson mentioned, you know, there are drills that you can do to try uh, to try and work on this. But at the end of the day, a lot of it just comes from from in cage experience, just from being in those fights um, and knowing that, okay. This is this is what I have to do. I didn't get the finish. Now I now this is what I have to do. Um, I'm feeling tired. Okay, I can grab on here and I can hold for a little while to get my breath back. Or maybe now it's just time to stick and move for a little while, land a couple of kicks, get my breath back. Yeah, because those are things that only experience can teach you. As we said before, Tony Ferguson is one of those fighters. He will suck you into his pace and he will keep coming after you even if he gets hit. If it means that you are if you are matching the the speed and tempo that he knows you can't match you know that you can't keep it up as long as he can that it has a different effect on you than it does on him and venata started to feel the effects of this despite having a really great first round and almost certainly winning the first round and very well he definitely won the first round you could possibly call it a 10-8 because he really really had ferguson close to being knocked out and yet when when venata came into the second round he was he was tired and this is the guy I always I always call uh, call out or, or name, not calling him out. This is the guy I always name for things like this, Aaron Pryor. When Aaron Pry- if you've ever watched an Aaron Pryor fight, if you haven't watched an Aaron Pryor fight, please do yourself a favor of doing it right now. Go watch Aaron Pryor versus Alexis Arguello one, and uh, just sit back and enjoy the show. But you will notice how crazily aggressive Aaron Pryor is at the start of every fight. He comes out at a blistering pace, slipping his way inside and hitting you with four, five, six punch combinations right off the bat. And even Aaron Pryor can't keep up that pace. But Aaron Pryor is a smart fighter, and he has learned from experience. And so when Aaron Pryor starts to feel that fatigue, he boxes. He, he bullshits, actually, is what he does. He makes it look like he's doing more than he is. He makes himself look like more of a threat than he is. He moves uh, just enough so that he can still get his breath back without being put in danger. He keeps his jab out there, and he faints. He may now and again slip in a heavy shot to kind of scare you off from chasing him down and pressing him when he's tired. 
but you don't really know that he's tired when he's tired. And that's not what Lando Venata did. When Lando Venata started to get tired, he thought, all right, I'm going to lose the fight unless I sell out on a knockout punch and get Ferguson out of here. He basically dug his hole a little bit deeper, thinking that the only way he could possibly win was to destroy Ferguson now or lose the fight. And that counterintuitively led him to lose the fight because he doesn't have the experience to know that he could bullshit a little bit. He could move around, stay light on his feet, just kind of keep Ferguson out of his effective range long enough to get his breath back and then more effectively press the attack. Yeah, exactly. And this was something that that Venata himself realized. It was something that 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 both of his coaches realized. They had all talked about it. Like they were aware of this. They all knew that this was. They all knew that that was what was happening. But so um, shifting gears a little bit, going to talk about uh, Leo Santa Cruz versus Carl Frampton. If you only watch one boxing match this year, this is not a bad one to. Uh, this is not a bad one to go with. Mm-hmm. There have Hol- been some good ones too, by the way. Boxing is finally starting to win me back after what felt like a really long dry spell after May Pack, and also just being a a combat sports writer and analyst, I was personally very exhausted after the lead up to Mayweather Pacquiao, and um, so that was like. Uh, blue balls in a way (laughs) because the fight didn't really deliver the way we wanted it to. Um, You know, of course, everyone agrees Manny Pacquiao was robbed. He clearly won that fight. We all know that. Um, (laughs) But, uh, but afterwards it was like, Oh, okay. And then even, even boxing promoters like, all right, we're done with boxing for a little bit. We're going to wait till halfway through 2016 and then start to put on some good fights again. But now we've got Terrence Crawford in there. We've got Errol Spence in there. We've got, um, Carl Frampton and Leo Santa Cruz. We've got tons of really good fighters putting on tons of really good fights again. Uh, we have Sergey Kovalev and Andre Ward about to fight in November. Good things are on the horizon. Good things have been happening. And among that number, Leo Santa Cruz versus Carl Frampton was one of the better fights. More so, I think, than Keith Thurman versus Sean Porter, which was a, a more action-packed fight with more of the fighters hurting each other, more really dramatic things happening. But this one was just as fast paced. And I thought both fighters were smarter about the way they chose to fight each other. So it was a little more fulfilling. It wasn't just like, uh, I know these guys are better than this, but they're engaging in a brawl. They engaged in a brawl at times and they both made adjustments throughout the fight. Yeah, this was a, this was a battle of two smart dudes fighting in way uh, fighting in smart ways for most of the fight. Like there, I mean, I think Santa Cruz did some things that were, uh, did some, did not necessarily fight to, uh, to, to his best benefit at various points in time, but Frampton also engaged and uh, also, also did some stuff that did not serve him mm-hmm. particularly well. He tried to out dog uh, Santa Cruz a few times. Yeah. Well, and he also like, like Frampton has this terrible habit. I don't, if you, if you guys have never watched Carl Frampton before you should, because he's a super interesting fighter where, and Santa Cruz is just tons and tons and tons of fun. Like Santa Cruz is like an action fighter par excellence, but like a really uh, sharp and technical one mm-hmm. as, as well. Like, it reminds me so of getting J check actually. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I would say Santa Cruz was the taller guy in this matchup, but he didn't fight like it. So Frampton did, one of my very favorite things in in all of combat sports, which is a short guy fighting long. Yeah, um, he did a really good job, not just of jabbing, but of using his lead hand to uh, to keep Santa Cruz off him when he retreated, of setting the distance with it, yeah. um, of jabbing after a combination to reset his particular distance. He actually like, didn't jab with committed jabs that much compared to other fights. Mm-hmm. I think the statistics that he threw about half as many actual snapping jabs as he usually does. Yeah, but he did a good job of using of yeah. holding his lead hand out and hiding his chin yes. behind it and using it to, and saying, OK, th- I've, I know that if my lead hand is here, then I can throw then I can throw punches afterwards. And using that lead hand to bait Santa Cruz into throwing the into throwing shots that Frampton could then counter. Yeah. Well, and I think that happened for a reason. This really the reason we wanted to talk about this fight is. The, the reasons are twofold. A, it was a great fight that deserves to be discussed, but B, it really ties into the fundamentals of what boxing is. Like, wh- what are the principles that make boxing such an effective martial art, um, which is kind of the topic of our episode. And for Frampton, it's very interesting, in the same way that it's always interesting to talk about footwork when an orthodox fighter fights a southpaw, it's always interesting to talk about distance management when a short fighter fights a long fight against a bigger man. And I think the reason that Carl Frampton did not jab, uh, did not step in with as many jabs as he normally does, is because being the shorter guy, 
it's always a misconception that short guys can't fight on the outside, obviously, because Carl Frampton did it. Other great fighters have done it. One of my, my hipster favorite that I always like to mention is Miguel Canto, a great um, flyweight boxer who uh, was always much shorter than his opponents but fought brilliantly, brilliantly and in and out game. But the difference for a short fighter on the outside is that you can't jab with your opponent the way you can if you're longer or you have more or less identical reach. Where Carl Frampton to use his jab the way he he did it at 122 pounds, where he to use his jab and, and sort of fence with Leo Santa Cruz, he would be inviting his reach disadvantage upon himself. He would be engaging in a contest which he couldn't win. And so instead he used his jab to make Leo Santa Cruz commit. He gave him something to react to, to counter, and then stepped in while Santa Cruz was stepping in and forced him, forced the bigger man to close the distance on himself, which I think is very, very brilliant. And we, we've seen some fighters do this in MMA, but nobody does it um, as consistently effectively as boxers do. And, and Frampton was just brilliant. There was one counter he landed that was so gorgeous. He had... Um, it was a counter to a counter. He was at long range. He pawed with his jab. Santa Cruz saw that and thought, I'm going to jab with him. But Frampton wasn't playing that game. Instead, Frampton was waiting on the jab. He stepped forward and shifted over his left hip. So his head came off the line of the jab and at the same time brought up a right uppercut. I call this uh, um, my, uh, my, my boxing mentor, Luis, calls this a Cuban uppercut because a lot of Cuban fighters throw it very well. But when you throw an uppercut, not by pulling back the way you're used to seeing it, but by shifting forward the way you would for an angle right hand. Yeah, like a like Eddie Alvarez's dart right. Yes, it's yeah. for, it, it, but with an uppercut instead and of Eddie a straight. And Eddie sometimes does it with an uppercut as well. Um, and yeah, and you will you'll slip your head over your hip the way you would for a right hook before a left hook, and bring the uppercut up as the other guy's leaning forward into his into the punch that you are slipping. And Frampton did that so beautifully, where he didn't have to. He he was either too far away. From, from Santa Cruz, or Santa Cruz was closing that distance for him and he was meeting him halfway. Yeah, and the the beauty of, of Frampton fighting long in this fight, not necessarily fighting on the outside the whole time, but fighting long, was that it created the circumstances that allowed him to lessen Santa Cruz's volume. So if, you, if you've never watched Leo Santa Cruz, the big thing you have to know about him is that he throws a lot of punches. He throws like 85 or 90 punches around mm -hmm. in general. And so if you're Carl Frampton, you can't afford to fight at that pace with a guy who's with a guy who's a little bit longer, because that means you're just going to be a touch too far outside to match that volume. Right. Frampton is not a guy who wants to work at that pace to start with, but he can't consent to fight at that pace because he's going to get outworked. That doesn't mean that he needed that he needs to pull Santa Cruz into a space where he's barely throwing, but it means that he needed to do something to lessen it just enough to the point where Frampton could, to the point where Frampton could keep up. Now, fighting long allowed him to do that because he was the because it allowed him to be the guy who picked and chose what distance what distance they were going to fight at and what exchanges got to happen. So that cut down on Santa Cruz's volume. It cut down on the number of punches that he could throw. It cut down on the number of punches he could land. And it created the circumstances that allowed Frampton to counter, which further cut down Santa Cruz's volume. There's no quicker way to make, a, to make an active fighter slow their pace than to counter them because it, makes, it forces them to stop and think. Mm -hmm. Quick pace fighters tend to be rhythm fighters and counters disrupt rhythm. Yeah. There were also, however, some there were some demonstrations of why it can be very difficult to be a small man playing an outside game. Uh, Frampton ran into some trouble, especially during the early portion of the fight. He did a lot of linear retreating. And so uh, on the most basic level, when you are out fighting, you kind of want to step in, land your pot shot, land your quick combination and step back out. And if you do that in straight lines or even sometimes if you use angles and the other guy knows where you're about to be, you are going to end up his his mid range is your close range your long range uh, your out of range is his long range is what i'm trying to say and so you step back far enough that you can no longer hit him and there were a few times in this fight when when frampton tried to do that and santa cruz was still able to find him uh was still able to follow him with jabs um and then there were times when frampton was stepping in and he ran into right hands before his could connect and so it is a difficult thing to do but it's just very interesting to see how a small guy manages distance uh and again you disagreed somewhat but i think this is uh, was also an interesting example of how that game is pro probably a little easier to play in boxing than it was in mma i felt like nami Yunus was trying to do some of the stuff that frampton was trying to do um but there are many other fights in MMA where we've seen where fighters 
have difficulty navigating that distance as easily as a guy like Frampton does because they can't out grapple their opponent or they have a skill disadvantage or a strength disadvantage or something inside where oh. close range is not mere neutralization for MMA fighters. Yeah. Oh, no, I didn't disagree about that general principle. Yeah, just, just I disagreed as it applied about to... Nami, just about Nami, how yeah. that worked out in terms of Nami units. That's what I meant like, to say. Yeah, no. So, like, no, because I agree about that fundamentally. Like, you can't... Um, but like if you watch Frampton Santa Cruz, when Frampton got onto the inside, he did a good job of using subtle steps to stay there. And he did a good job of knowing that Santa Cruz, he knew that Santa Cruz would, would be down to throw in those kind of head to head um, inside fighting exchanges. Right. Mm -hmm. Like he knew that Santa Cruz was going to be down for that. It was just a matter of getting there in the first place. But in MMA, you can't do that. Like if you get if, if you walk your way into that range as the as the smaller fighter, you run the risk of having the taller guy just clinch you, which is what yeah. Yair Rodriguez is going to do to to Alex Caceres or or, or take him out down with a blast double or something like that. Yeah, like there are just a lot more variables for that. It's a much more difficult kind of game to play. That doesn't mean you can't play mm -hmm. an outside game in MMA. It just means you need to have more tools to make that to make that work for yourself. And it's why we've seen so few truly successful outside fighters in MMA for so many years. Yeah, especially as the level of pressure fighting and, and boxing in general has in, improved. That the, you know, people are catching up to them and boxing for the outfighters is not yet so good that they can navigate that long distance consistently. Um, it's just, a, it's a tough game to play. There was one more thing. Uh, I, oh, I did think it was kind of funny how uh, the keys to victory that uh, the big boxing promotions always do that the hbo and showtime and pbc whoever's running the broadcast they always do like a keys to victory thing for these big fights to give people three very easily digestible things to think about they do this for um the ufc shows too and i always think the keys are kind of funny for ufc ones in particular they're they're really really vague they're, they're not the kind of thing you would ever tell to a fighter it's like okay your key to victory uh, score takedowns <laughs> like like that's so that's so vague that that just telling someone that or like when I did my um, gaps in the armor thing for for Vitor Belfort against Chris Weidman and people were like you didn't say to avoid takedowns like well I mean I guess that's a key to victory but that doesn't that's not helpful as a piece of advice for the fighter is just don't get taken down when <laughs> they probably there, is know that really that. a thing oh yeah what that people said that yeah yeah my game plan was on how to beat Chris Weidman they didn't say you didn't say don't get taken down it's like, well, yeah, of course he doesn't want to get taken down. <laughs> that's, that should go without saying. That's not a key to victory. That's a that's a basic tenet of the fight. But the funny thing is, is that one of the keys to victory for Carl Frampton of the Showtime team was that he needed to use his jab to work his way inside because that's what shorter fighters are usually expected to do against taller, longer fighters. And for Frampton, I thought he had his worst moments of the fight he ran into the most trouble when he was trying to really press the action and force his way into the pocket that was when santa cruz was able to counter him with right hands santa cruz landed a lot of clean right hands when frampton was chasing after him um and he had his most success when he fought the way they probably expected santa cruz to fight from long distance i just thought that was kind yeah. of odd yeah, I agree with that. I totally agree with that. Like, there's that's kind of the problem with being the with being the shorter fighter when you get it into your head that you have to uh, that you have to get all the way inside is you end up telegraphing that that's going to happen. You end up giving your opponent the you end up giving your opponent an open invitation to hit you in those spaces. Yeah. Yep. And you, you know, yeah, it's 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 interesting. Um, I like doing shows like this. I think we should. We're happy to accept suggestions. If anybody else has any other like grand concept things they feel they would like to be have discussed on the show of course we also have our $20 uh, patrons on Patreon who get to suggest a topic for a segment and if we really like one of those it could also become the overarching topic for an entire episode so give us your suggestions we will of course prioritize the people who have supported us but we are really interested in hearing anybody's ideas i like doing these shows i really liked our styles make fight series um, and i'd like to revisit that sometime down the line and i like just getting to talk about i don't know concepts are what excite me when it comes to fighting i like to look at things and try and understand the underlying principles behind why certain techniques work why certain strategies work and to understand the mentalities that make them possible and so it's always fun to approach a card from this perspective. Before we wrap up, Pat, do you want to give a quick prediction for um, this weekend's main event? Um, I think Rodriguez. I think 
I think Rodriguez is going to win it. He's a three to one favorite, and I think that's about right on the basis of what we've seen and what we know. Caceres is like Caceres has looked better in his last couple of fights than he ever has before, especially against Cole Miller. Um, but I think on some level we have to accept the fact that Caceres has never like the best fighter Caceres has ever beaten is Sergio Pettis. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like he just has not proven that he can compete on an elite le- like on an elite level and I think Rodriguez despite him having a whole bunch of holes in his game and things that he needs to fix a I think that he can fix some of those holes even if we haven't necessarily seen him do that yet uh, and B just the sheer physical gap in terms of size strength explosiveness um, is is so just enormous. raw athletic prowess so the fact that Rodriguez yeah. has been able to make a kicking and wrestling style work is that that basically like with Aljamain Sterling or John Jones, who have started with similar games at the very least, that is the mark of a pretty supreme athlete. It's a difficult style to make work and to feel like that's the natural way you should fight and to do it successfully. Um, I do think Caceres has shown that he can compete at the elite level, but not that he can succeed. And so I think that's going to be the difficult thing is that Caceres has always had it in him to have a good round. Uh, or even two good rounds against a really good fighter. He even had a pretty close fight with Uriah Faber when they fought, but he has never beaten those guys, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly so, exactly so. So, I don't know. I mean, I think the fact that it's five rounds and at altitude is interesting. I mean, I think, uh, uh, I mean, I, I, I lean toward, I, I lean pretty heavily towards Rodriguez, but I don't know how he does it. I can see him kind of outscoring and outpointing him. I could see him hurting Caceres and jumping on a submission. I could see him finishing with a spectacular knockout, even though Caceres is really durable. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I think it, it's an interesting fight. I'm looking forward to watching it. Um, Are you looking but, forward to it more than you're looking forward to Talis Lydas versus Chris Camozzi? Um Don't say yes. Because it, be, it would be a lie. <laughs> it would be a no, lie, right? No, the middleweight fight that I'm really looking forward to is Trevor Smith versus <laughs> Joseph G- Giliotti. Yeah. That's, that's the fight I'm looking that's forward to. That's a winner. To. That is a real winner. We've got two really prized middleweight fights. On that note, I'll let you guys know. We'll switch things up. Um, but before we, we close things out here, I'll let everyone listening know what I've got cooking this week. I'm planning a series, two or three articles over the next week and a half, breaking down basically all the fights I didn't break down going back to the weekend of UFC 200. I want to pick out all the best moments, things like Eddie Alvarez versus Rafael Dos Anjos, uh, probably something from the NJ Czech Adelia, various other fights in there, maybe something on Will Brooks, but also um, things from Nama Yunus Kovalkiewicz, things from Holm Shevchenko, all these little things that I missed while we've been, you know, the schedule's been crazy and I was on vacation last week. I want to do a technique recap series doing like a brief breakdown of one thing from each of those fights. And then, which is why I segued to me first, Phil McKenzie and I are going to be doing a League of of Extraordinary Journeymen. (laughs) Boy, that's a good title, huh? A League of Extraordinary Journeymen installment this week to recap all of the crazy middleweight shit that has happened over the past few months. Um, We have yet to talk about Michael Bisping beating up Luke Rockhold. We have yet to talk about... Chris Camozzi beating up Vitor Miranda or Dan Kelly uh, destroying Antonio Carlos Jr. So many crazy things have happened in this division. And then, of course, uh, I'm Mrs. Camozzi, so I have to talk about Chris Camozzi's reckoning with Talos Lytus this weekend before it happens. So I'm looking as, forward to that. As you described the things that you were going to talk about there, I could I could audibly hear your audience shrinking. <laughs> <laughs> Dan Kelly knocking out Antonio Carlos Jr. is fascinating. It is so <laughs> bizarre, and it, sh- it wouldn't happen in any other division. Like, oh my, God. my comparison is Hani Yaya beats Matt Lopez, and in some part of your brain, it makes sense. Dan Kelly beating Antonio Carlos Jr. doesn't make sense. It only happens at middleweight. <laughs> well, I will look forward to reading those articles. Thank you, Pat. You alone, you, me, and Phil will just click the page a bunch of times to make it look like uh, people care. <laughs> I'm down for all of that. You know, you know, I'm in for a cl- for a little click farming. <laughs> very sure, very sure of that. Uh, what do you have coming this week, Pat? Um, nothing too much interesting. I'm kind of I'm kind of loaded up. I did a uh, post fight winners and losers piece on uh, on on UFC 201, which a lot of people took the time to tell me what a fucking idiot I was for uh, for saying that I thought Robbie Lawler would have a hard time of winning his title back. Thanks to thanks to uh, all the people who commented telling me that people uh, really then, hate Tyron Woodley, by the way, they really do. man. Yeah. That's that's weird to me. Even like, after knocking out Robbie Lawler, they think he's a bum 
and like complete trash and garbage. The, it's very the, strange. It, it really seemed to bother people that he was getting the title shot in the first place. Yeah. Like people do not want him to succeed. Yeah. Well, um, you know, there's a, uh, well, we, we could get deep into there uh, are layers into the to MMA why that fans is. communities, history of feelings towards African-American fighters. If we wanted to, towards but I don't feel like we there, need there to is a reason that. that MMA fans unilaterally chose rampage Jackson over Rashad Evans. And it's not because rampage is an eloquent speaker. No, um, yeah, <laughs> but so yeah. but I, no, I mean, that, that's uh, we, we could have a long conversation about that if we wanted to, but we're not going to. Um, so that's uh, so that's one thing I got. Uh, I did a piece with uh, with my colleague Stephen Rondina about uh, about Nick Diaz's return and, uh, you know, a bunch of different people that he could fight and who we think he should fight. Uh, Stephen thought that uh, Stephen thinks he should fight Nick Diaz. I think uh, I think that's crazy talk. Uh, I would love to see. I would love to see him fight. Uh, to see Tyron Woodley fight GSP, though, I'm down for that. Uh, so... I, I either want to see Tyron Woodley fight Nick Diaz at UFC 202, or fight a contender after a full camp, like an actual contender. Yeah. I either well, want to have a good, ridiculous fight very soon and see Woodley defend his belt immediately, or I want to see Stephen Thompson get in there, basically. Yeah, I mean, but I think, you know, all uh, all credit to Tyron Woodley because I hope that that in his willingness to talk about these big fights and his willingness and his ability to get those guys talking about fights with him, I hope that that means he gets a nice pay raise out of it sure. before he fights Stephen Thompson or whatever ends up happening. It there. makes sense, man. Yeah, do do what you got to do, T Wood. Um, but then I will have my usual preview of this weekend's card and then I think that's about it. I'm uh I'll be traveling on Friday. I'm going up to Sacramento. I'm going to spend a little uh, little time at Team Alpha Male for a story I'm working on. Uh, but that's uh, that's it. That's all I'm doing. All right. Well, I'm looking forward to all of that. I am looking forward to coming back here and, and having some new suggestions and some crazy ideas for things to talk about. There are many great fights, both in the realms of boxing and MMA. Pat, you've been watching a lot more boxing lately, so maybe we can cover... Um, and, and enlighten our, our mostly MMA-based audience on which fights are most interesting and, uh, and talk about more of the interplay between the two arts. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff coming, a lot of stuff that we're excited to talk about. Thank you guys for joining us today. Thank you once again to our Patreon patrons for supporting us. Uh, if you all came here today for the finer points of face punching, you came to the right place. This has been, of course, Heavy Hands. <laughs>